from different perspectives. Finally, students demonstrate their ability to produce a tangible product that integrates their course content, uh, contents with the chosen topic. The student projects resulting from the program are showcased at the end of the semester, and they are judged by faculty from non-participating courses to ensure fairness. The winners will be awarded cash prizes, so your efforts will not be in vain. Now, let me briefly discuss the chosen theme for this curricular integration program, which, and as you know, the title is the production, representation, and reimagining of spaces in language and literature. You will find the concept note as well as the rules for submission in an email that has already been shared with you. Please do take a look. And also your course teacher will discuss the details in their respective courses. Without wasting any time, let us start the event officially. The chief speaker for today's event is Professor Saeed Munzurul Islam, Professor of English and Humanities at ULAB. But before we invite him to give his talk, I would first request the Honorable Special Advisor to the Board of Trustees, Professor Shamshad Murtuza, to present his welcome address. So please. Thank you, Mahesh. Uh, that's wonderful. Uh, thank you for contextualizing the uh, session. So you know, this is really, really an exciting event, and uh, we're really proud to have this uh, signature event as part of our departmental program. Looking at spaces, like you know, uh, you know, so what better way to talk about space rather than like you know having Professor Said Manzul Islam, like you know, so uh, I I know for a fact that you know he's the first one to discuss the idea of space in literature in our uh, in the curricula, like in a sense of promoting this idea uh, in like in a postmodern context uh, and. Uh, especially in terms of like, you know, so uh, in art, uh, he has done uh, commendable research and I'm sure you'll be benefited by his scholarship. But as Mehek was saying, so uh, this program, we talk about praxis, which is like, you know, putting theory into practice. So you do a lot of things in a text, uh, in, a, in a classroom setting. And this is one opportunity to you know, practice those ideas, you know, so bring it out of the classroom and also to showcase it, you know, uh, in, a, in a larger uh, platform where you can learn from one another. You can see what others are doing, what others are thinking. So I'm teaching a course on romanticism this term. And in fact, I was thinking like, you know, how I could apply the concept of space, you know, um, in terms of romantic poets. And uh, the first thing that came to my mind was London by Blake, you know, so the chartered streets, the, uh, the chartered river Thames, and how a city can be chartered, you know, in terms of like, you know, looking at London uh, as a graph paper. Now, this is a very recent uh, discourse, you know, so uh, this idea of uh, writing London has been promoted by uh, one of my uh, favorite critics. Uh, Julian Wilfrey, you know, so Wilfrey has written about, you know, a lot of things about writing about London. So I'm sure my students will get an opportunity to talk about that or showcase their ideas. So the same goes for other courses as well, you know, so um, I'm sure like, you know, Mojusa will talk about how you make your own spaces, you know, how you do not want to be confined by the space that is allotted to you. you know? So when you exercise your freedom, uh, so, for example, this field that you see in front of you is restricted, so there is like no go sign, but still you somehow manage your way into the field, you know, so you make your own road, you know, so you uh, walk along the uh, field and make your own space. And that's exactly what literature is all about. Literature is all about, you know, a verbal space. You know, it, it is a literary space, you know, space, you know, so if you look at the literary meaning of the word stanza, which means a room, you know, so when you think of a stanza, it's nothing but a room, so it's a composition. Uh, when you think of an ode, so it's a stanza form, so there are many rooms. And when you think about run on lines, you know, you're breaking the line, you're moving from one space to another space, you know. And, you know, modern writers in, in particular, so they look about uh, using the form 
to reflect on the content. So there's a relationship between the form and content. So this is a huge opportunity for you to uh, apply the critical thinking. So again, the buzzword is critical thinking, you know, so, uh, and your creative expression. So uh, Arifa has done the OB curriculum for us. And so uh, UGC wants to make sure that our students, when they graduate from the department, so they get these ideas, you know, as essential skills. Uh, so we just do not have them on paper, you know, so just as a checklist for uh, the satisfaction of UGC. So we really mean business. And I'm so glad that, you know, so the English department is doing it and our faculty members like, you know, are more than willing to uh, guide your ideas, shape your ideas. And uh, I look forward to the final project and I'm sure like, you know, you will use multimodal format. So it's not going to be only, you know, presentation in terms of a PowerPoint slides. You can do skit, you can do animation, you know, you can do performances, you know, so you can even create your own space and own form. And that's what all uh, this is all about. So thank you so much. And uh, so I hope you are very productive uh, CI forum. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for getting us excited about space. I would now like to request our honorable professor and Dean School of Arts and Humanities, Professor uh, Kaiser Hamidul Hawk, to share a few words. So please. Good afternoon, everyone. Space and time go together. This is uh, siesta time. So I will not uh, blame you if you tend to doze off. Um, however, this is a very interesting subject, as you can see. I have a problem here. Is it curricular integration or curriculum? Production, representation, and reimagining of spaces in language and literature. Do we produce space or do we remold it, restructure it, play with it? We can represent it, we can reimagine it. And why spaces are not simply space? Of course, as soon as you start thinking about space and representation and imagination, you see all kinds of things come to, come to your mind. Um, there are psychological spaces, there are social spaces, there are physical spaces. And as students of literature and language, you have to deal with all of them. Um, and there are different um, interpretations of space which can contest with each other. So not long ago, I was teaching Robert Frost and I, uh, one of the poems that we did was uh, Desert Places. And there, um, this po little poem is a repost in my uh, interpretation to something said by Pascal, Blaise Pascal in the 17th century. Pascal was filled with metaphysical dread when he contemplated the vast spaces of the universe. And so he wrote, the eternal silence of these infinite spaces terrifies me. Frost's poem ends by saying, I do not, as I paraphrase, uh, I'm not scared of the spaces where there's no life. The inner uh, space in me, it can be more terrifying because that is a poem about clinical depression and Frost used to suffer from clinical depression. 
It's a psychological space which terrifies him, you see. And once we start thinking about space and looking at the different ways space is presented in writing, in uh, painting, in the cinema, you see, uh, our imagination takes off. We all become space travelers. So I hope you will all enjoy this uh, voyage into the vast space of culture where various ways of looking at space and depicting space um, play an important role. And that way, I hope all of you will find your own space in life and in the world. And the ultimate space is, of course, the space where there is happiness. I hope you find that happiness one day. Thank you very much. And I'll, I'll go over to SMI, Dada. Thank you so much, Kaza, sir, for enlightening us with your wisdom. And now the time has arrived to listen to our honorable chief speaker for the day. Dr. Said Mundurul Islam is a professor of English and Humanities at ULAB and formerly at the Department of English, University of Dhaka. He's an award-winning fiction writer and art critic. Professor Islam is perhaps the only bilingual author in Bangladesh who writes with equal ease and fluency in both Bangla and English. He has eight short story collections and five novels to his credit. Professor Islam received the Bangla Academy Award for Literature in 1996 and the Ekushe Padok in 2018 for his contributions to Bangla literature. He was the president of Pen Bangladesh from 2018 to 2020. Professor Islam's area of special interest include Shakespeare, modern poetry and fiction, literary theory, postmodernism, postcolonialism, and translatology. Sir, it is an honor to hear you speak today. I will not uh, rob you people any further of listening to him. But... Thank you, Mahek. Um, <clears throat> we miss our bathroom, right, cousin? I'm already spaced out. <laughs> what can I speak on, on space? Uh, and we do produce space. Kaiser just suggested, can we produce space? We do produce space because we lose our cultural space every day. We have to produce our cultural space in an act of will. We also have to produce our political space where this is constricted or lost. So space is not simply physical, but it's something which spreads out everywhere. Um, I'll begin formally. So honorable advisor to the trustee board, Professor Shamshad Mortuza, honorable dean, Professor Kaiser Hamidul Haq, honorable HOD and colleagues, and good afternoon to all of you. I hope I, I sound suitably soporific so that you can go to sleep and those are. Um, I begin with Michel Foucault, and he tells you why space is important and why space studies is important. This is a quote. A whole history remains to be written of space, history of space or spaces, which would at the same time be the history of powers. So you see how it connects space with power from the great strategies of geopolitics to the little tactics of the habitat, domestic politics, for example, community politics. So space is a site of politics. That's what Foucault suggests. Just one aspect of his many lectures, many thoughts on space. space. If you compile them, this would be a huge volume. So much he has written on space. And in today's discussion, I will try to explain why this is so. Although I will not strictly follow what Mehak had suggested, the contextualizing. She gave you a number of do's that I have to tick 
all the boxes. I do not, I do not. I'm like one of my students, some of my students, no matter what I teach them, no matter what the question is, they will write, just simply write their answers. And they get out away with a B maybe. So I hope to speak without following the guidelines that you have given, but I'm sure I'll throw plenty of hints so that you can develop your own thesis, if you will. And at the end of my lecture, I'll give you a number of topics that you can really work on. These are exciting topics, waiting to be explored and waiting to be discovered in every sense of the term. So I'll explain um, the concept of space as um, Shamshad and Kaiser have suggested, always generated broad philosophical interests and inquiries, as well as discussions from the very ancient times. Um, there was somebody who wrote a um, long time ago, and um, somebody from Arabia, um, oh, I forgot. I, I don't find his name in this place. Um, anyway, he was an 11th century Arab scholar who wrote about Mokam, Mokam is space. So 11th century Arabia, somebody writing about how to manage your space, and he did not only mean physical space, your emotional space, means how much people are interested in space. You can go back to uh, Plato and Aristotle, Timaeus, Plato talks about space. So it is something which is ongoing. And um, Basically, people are interested to find out what space means. And it's phenomenology, phenomenological essence and it's geometry. So essence, what is the essence of space for the geometry of space? This engaged many thinkers, scholars, and writers. And it is considered the space, considered fundamental to the understanding of the physical universe. Space is what gives to our existence a dimension that impacts our material, psychological, and social life. So that way, space is so vital. And based on what space means to individuals and how space impacts um, in so many ways their emotional, psychological, and other lives, representations of human life and human emotions therefore have a necessary spatial dimension. We consider any representation in the dimension of a space. Space has thus become a focus of critical attention in literary studies and also something called spatial analysis has assumed a special place in the critical inquiry in our time, particularly after the spatial term, which happened in the late 20th century. A particular term, which is different from earlier preoccupation with space. I'll explain in a minute how this is different. But there is one problem, the dominance of a physicalist view of space. A physicalist view of space somehow continues in our analysis of human spatiality. Does the term social, for example, or political or economic? We continuously use the term social, political, economic, and even historical, generally suggests a link to human action and motivation. But the term spatial evokes a physical or geometrical image, something external to the social context. So that's very important. When you say space, we somehow think of an emptiness, and hence outer space, the infinite space, no human beings there. So the human agency has not been always accepted when you speak of space. That comes later in postmodern term, which is also the spatial term. Uh, and so Frederick Jameson, an American Marxist, if you know him, Frederick Jameson suggests how modernism is important how modernism in its obsession with time. Modernists were obsessed with managing time because the Romantics, for example, inherited 
a system of keeping time which was solemn. They did not go by the calendar. It was seasonal and somehow dominated by the sun. So they were not really worried about time. But by the turn of the industrial age, industrial clock came. And I don't know how many of you have, have an alarm clock of industrial strength waking you up in the morning. I had one, I broke it. So I suggest anyone having an alarm clock, please break it. Don't listen to alarm clocks. That completely puzzles your body's uh, clock. So industrial time is essentially time measured in days, months. Remember John Donne? He considered the days, months, hours, the rags of time. He dismissed industrial time as something we did not really bother about. He was for eternal time, so to say. So in modernism's obsession with time, space was minimized. Um, he maintained the passage from modernism to postmodernism, the passage from modernism to postmodernism that happened sometime after the Second World War, when modernism had exhausted its claims or the Enlightenment um, meta-narratives had proved to be very false or untenable. And so there was a turn slowly taking place in culture, which was accompanied by the rise of the visual culture, the coming of television, and later coming of MTV, when songs could be seen. I grew up at a time when songs were never seen. They were supposed to be listened to. And now you cannot imagine anyone listening to songs. They are always watching songs. So, uh, so the waning of the modernist themes of time and temporality. So somehow this became less important. And this is a quote from Frederick Jameson. Our daily life, our psychic experiences, our cultural language, languages are today dominated by the categories, categories of space rather than time. So let me read this again. Our psychic experiences, our daily life, and our cultural languages today are dominated by the categories of space rather than time. You might disagree, but I agree, generally speaking, with Jameson because the text speaks sense. In preceding period of high modernism, on the other hand, space was minimized, as you said, and time was given more importance. Hence, modern writers were totally conscious of how to manage time, stream of consciousness technique, for example. Or Henri Barson, Henry Barson, but in front of Kaiser, I cannot say Henry Barson, I would say Henri Barson, <laughs> French philosopher of time, suggested time is nothing but duration. So time became something which everyone engaged with. And you can see James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, everyone responding to the need to shape uh, their works in accordance with their understanding of time. And he was, um, Frederick Jameson was uh, responding to the architecture, it's a postmodern architecture you see in the Bonaventure Hotel in Los Angeles, which has no specific entry point, no exit point, the lobby is curiously shaped. So he says one, when one enters this hotel, the body system is defeated by the orderliness of space. Rather, the body had to adjust to the disorderly system of space. And once the body is adjusted to this disorderly space, this bewildering presence of all these um, labyrinths that you have in the hotel, then it makes sense that space is something your body adjusts to, eventually produced by your body. So that's what it is. And spatial studies, spatial studies is an emerging interdisciplinary field truly interdisciplinary. So when you are um, working on space, you really have to go to some other related areas or fields of knowledge. For example, um, it is inter interdisciplinary, but it is centered on the problematics of space, place, and cultural geography. Cultural geography is not simply the geography that you read 
in your class, um, in your textbooks. That geography has a different cartography, different arrangement of spaces. For example, when the West discovered third world, it was a political geography imposed on us. And Edward Said has suggested how in Orientalism, how the cartography of the West created so sharp divisions. And there was a map drawn in which more than half of the world was Europe and North America. So cartography also shows you his relationship with power. And you have, for example, social theorists and historians, geographers, for example, Foucault, I'll mention Foucault several times. Geographers, I'll mention Edward Soya, a postmodern geographer, uh, very famous and very influential. Architects, uh, Bernard Schumi is an architect who has used all Charles Jenks, for example, is a good example here. Anthropologists, philosophers, Gilles Deluge, Jacques Derrida, art critics, and literary and cultural critics, including Frederick Jameson, and you have Edward Said and Raymond Williams. I'm just giving you a few names. Now, in this process, some earlier thinkers who took up spatial questions have also been rediscovered in the process. There are several earlier thinkers about whom uh, interests have been renewed. I'll mention only three. One is Martin Heidegger, who in a book called Being and Time, talks about his ideas of embodiment, worlding, imagining the world sitting in a place, which is maybe a narrow space, and enframement, which of course, film directors always use, enframement, bringing things into a frame, and dwelling, or Gaston Bachelard, who is a French philosopher, uh, mainly of this century, 1884 to 1962, in a book called The Poetics of Space, for his idea of lyrical spatial phenomenology. Or Michael Buckley, um, for his analysis of novelistic chronotopes. Now, chronotopes are configurations of time and space as they're represented in language and discourse. So novelistic chronotopes, how language explores the intrinsic connections, how novels explore the intrinsic connections between temporal, temporality and spatiality. And these are artistically expressed. So once you, three very important thinkers. Now, what links the works of these various thinkers and theorists is a rejection, is a rejection of the privilege given earlier to temporality and history over space. I told you in the beginning that modernism gave more importance to temporality and history over space. This is being reversed now. That's a new trend. Uh, Michel Foucault notes in an interview in 1976 that's just when the spatial turn was taking place. He was one of the philosophers and critics who influenced the spatial turn. Uh, in an interview in 1976, um, notes that the devaluation of space, devaluation of space had prevailed for generations of intellectuals. He was almost accusing all those generations of intellectuals not to give, for not giving enough attention to what space indicates. Uh, space was treated, and this is what I'm, quotish, I'm quoting Foucault. He says, space was treated as the dead, the fixed, the undialectical, the immobile. So space was treated as the dead, dead, Maragetsu space, the fixed, passive, the undialectical, the immobile. Time, on the contrary, was a richness, fecundity, life, dialectic. The straight line dividing earlier and now after Foucault talks about space. 
So he says this was how in the past um, time was divided. This is a man who is also very influential in uh, the space studies. He's <laughs> Henri Lefebvre, <laughs> Henry Lefebvre for you and me. And um, he says, early 20th century, this is a paraphrase of this man, early 20th century art and physics and mathematics, in this space, there was more often synonymous with rigidity, uh, immobility, stasis. Space itself had become a blind field. So he says, space holds the promise of liberation. This is Lefebvre talking to you, space holds the promise of liberation. Liberation from the tyranny of time, right? Apart from anything else, but also from social repression and exploitation, from self-imprisoning categories. Liberation into desire, now is very meaningful. That's what it said here. Um, um, echoing Michel Foucault. In Discipline and Punish, The Birth of the Prison, Foucault's um, seminal book, which came out in 1975, he examines the attention given to the body. In particular, and this is a quote, the way in which the body itself is invested by power relations. The body itself is invested by power relations. Now, this is a topic you can work on. How body in literature is seen to be invested with power relations. There's no neutral body in literature, unfortunately. I suppose it is impossible to write a fiction when there is a body in fiction to make it as if its associations are simply within the anatomy or the geography of the body. So that is what he says. Um, and then another one, he says, um, our society is one not of spectacle. Now, this he says in response to Guy Debord, a situationist, anarchist, Marxist. Wow, can't get worse than that. <laughs> Guy Debord wrote a book, surprisingly, 1968, long before internet and all these revolutions that take place, making our life very visual. He wrote a book called uh, The Society of the Spectacle. Now, spectacle is not simply show, the glamour or glow, whatever it is, but also the material aspect related to show. Branding creates a spectacle to sell items in large numbers. He says, no, our society is not one of spectacle, but of surveillance. As we are speaking here, I don't know whether CCTV cameras are recording our presence. Imagine. Oh yes, you see, we are under surveillance. <laughs> and it reminds you of Panopticon, isn't it? Jeremy Benson's idea that we are 24 seven under watch. Who is watching you, you do not know. Big brother is watching you. And who is a big brother, you never know. So he's right. Our society is one of con constant surveillance. And he wonders, and this is his famous question. He asks himself, basically, why prisons resemble factories? Prisons rem rem uh, rem uh, resemble factories. Have you been to any factory in Bangladesh? Even the most environmentally certified green factory, garments factory? Inside you ask anyone, that's a prison. That's nothing but prison. I hope you don't feel like you live in the prison. So, if it is a prison, what lovely wardens you have sitting there. I wish I was in a prison like this. And then it says the surveillance creates a carceral network, carceral incarceration, prison-like uh, situation. You are incarcerated carceral space. Think for yourself for a second, aren't we living in a society in which you are living in a carceral space? is not only the 24 seven surveillance, is the gazes. Now, girls sitting at the back or here, aren't you exposed to the male gaze once again, as long as you are out or maybe even in your home? That male gaze 
just fix, fixes you uh, at a point of time and denies your private space. So that private space is another thing we are losing, isn't it? And so, and remember this uh, Panopticon or whatever carceral network, which is the greatest supporter in modern society of the normalizing powers. Normalizing powers have a great supporter in the carceral um, networks. This man, uh, Henri Lefebvre, similarly rejects the older representation of space as a pre-existing void. Now, once again, I, I read one paragraph, a few lines, but he also believed that in the earlier times, space was considered a pre-existing void, a void, mind you, a void is not inhabited. So human beings are taken away from space. Space is an abstract entity uh, in which there is no human dimension. So he says, endowed with formal properties alone, a container waiting to be filled by a content that is matter or bodies comes as an afterthought. Lefebvre argues that any socially produced historical space is constituted by spatial practices. Now it's important. Ask any architect whether he has any spatial practice in mind. That means how we would organize space. Um, usually modern architecture um, that you have in our apartment complexes, don't bother about spatial arrangement. Your kitchen, for example, do you, have you ever asked why kitchens in our apartments have law counters? You haven't. Law counters can only be, you cannot reach. I, mean, I, I live in an apartment, uh, we do not have any domestic help. So I sometimes have to work in the kitchen as well. It's very difficult, like stooping down. Why? Because young maids, 12, 13, work in your homes. They are the ones who are comfortable with this height. And have you ever looked at the servant's room? If there is a room, not even one body can adjust comfortably there. So architects trained to give a colonial reading of space. So a, a maid does not need any space. And Jonab and Bibi will not have to go to the kitchen as long as this girl is here. And have you ever seen how colonial practice also prevails when a girl comes with, for example, her name is Rahanum, Tabassum Rahnuma. She'll be instantly turned into Angura. And a man comes with the name Shamshad. He said, you are more feet. Taking away the identity and agency at one go. And this happens in every house many households in our country. So you see space is a very contested place in which you can lose your identity or gain your identity. And that takes us to certain terms I'll explain, not explain but mention. I shouldn't do everything for you. So I'll give you some teasers and you have to fill the blanks. Um, so Lefebvre links theorizations to a, all right, so he says, Lefebvre argues that any socially produced historical space, uh, I, I, I'm hoping that Kaiser will one day explain if he agrees with this socially produced historical space. Uh, quite a few ideas condensed here. Allied with, he says, re respectively, the domains of the perceived, the conceived, and the lived. So perceived domain, conceived domain, and lived domain. These are different entities and we create them. And he says these theorizations are in line with the growing predominance in modern times of the visual. So which has increasingly, this is a quote, has increasingly taken precedence over elements of thought and action deriving from other thoughts. It's a dense idea. I mean, I don't think I can explain it in this short space I have, but Think about how domains are perceived, conceived, and lived. Lived, of course, you can understand, but perceived. There are spaces of perception. 
the spaces of conception is possible. So the denial of the dynamic as against static nature of space has its literary analog. Uh, in such modernist writers, I'll just only, I'll give you only one to strike home the, the point. So the denial of the dynamic as against static nature of space has literary analogs in such writers as Henry James. I don't know whether you have read Henry James, a very famous modernist writer who celebrates the portrayal of the complex psychology of characters as the highest achievement of narrative art. So his celebration of complex psychological characters as the highest achievement of narrative art. Characters are fundamentally temporal constructs that unfold in a space. So space is just a setting. Literary space is the setting that you have. Now, if you have taken any fiction writing course, you are introduced to elements of fiction. And of course, Shamshad can tell you because he has taken this course in Kaiser, that you tell about character, you tell about plot and all these things. You also talk about setting. A setting is a place, but setting is completely dominated by the characters. And the more psychological the characters are, the more psychological complexities you have to unfold, the less important space carries. So the work of Foucault, Lefebvre, the postponent geographer, Edward Sawyer, and others show how space itself is a production. Now to answer Kaiser's question, space itself is a production shaped through uh, a diverse range of social processes and human interventions. Their work has helped to foster an increasing attention to the representation of space within literary and other cultural texts. And now this is evident, and I'm sure Kaiser can tell us more about it. Raymond Williams, a survey of modern British literature, Kaiser, The Country and the City, came out in 1973. Um, I first saw this in a Canadian library, a Queen's University library, the country and the city, where he examines the changing structures of feeling. Structures of feeling is a coinage by uh, Raymond Williams. He believes that every age there is a structure of feeling, which is documented and documents a part of culture, an aspect of culture for the next generations. So the structures of feeling concerning the relationship between the city and the country. Williams is spatially sensitive to the ways literary and cultural texts reflect changes in actual spatial practices. A similar, this should be very interesting for you because you must have, some of you have taken post courses in post-colonial literature. A similar kind of investigation is taken up by Edward Said in Culture and Imperialism, a big tome, big book where he argues for the importance of a careful attention to the geographical notation, this is quotation, geographical notation, the theoretical mapping and charting of territory that underlies Western fiction. He wants you to look at the fresh pair of eyes as how Western fiction charts territories and maps territories, both theoretically and shown in practice. And of course, in historical writing and philosophical discourse, why? Because the more you read the Western interpretation of space, as I've said, there was once a map in which Europe was most of the world. So the minimizing of the Eastern representations were seen to be in proportion to their ability to understand the world around them. Why did Colonialists believe their colonization was justified. One was we are taking civilization to the East. Why was urbanism so much preferred? Because urbanism is a very familiar way of managing greeds, territories. You can map a city and the city becomes divided into high end neighborhoods and slums and ghettos. Once again, what constitutes space management in a city? Look at Dhaka city. You have huge um, high-end areas, Baridhara and everything, and you have 
Kodai Bosti or Shatola Bosti. Why is it? The coexistence tells you a lot about how space reflects social interactions or lack of interactions or social divisions, inequality and inequity. Frederick Jameson maintains that we need to dispense with a singular universal set of criteria dealing, defining great literature. Now, I'm sure you know about canonical literature. This is how literature is known as great literature is known, against which we can then evaluate all works regardless of time, place, or situation of their production. And instead become more sensitive to particular aims, practices, and strategies of diverse works, genre, and forms. Thus, he says in his essay on third world literature, Jameson, he argues that a common critical error is the reading of non canonical forms of literature in terms of the canon itself, by which he means here the forms of a hegemonic European realism and modernism. This attention to the way various cultural texts map space has also contributed to the formulations of the political aesthetic practice he calls cognitive mapping. Now, cognitive mapping is important here because this is how you map a culture from your perspective of Western understanding of whatever cartography you are thinking of. Then cartography developed after the Renaissance. One reason why, because cartography was needed for exploration. Colonization depended on exploration of new spaces and industrialization, which came with the help of science and technology invented and improved navigational instruments. Eventually these two forces, colonization and capitalism created many aspects of industrialization, urbanization. So they were the ones who initiated the process of making separate spaces or spaces separate in terms of areas in terms of class terms. and here i'm getting um, only two three four minutes this new attention to the production of space has entered into literary studies from a number of different directions one is marxism and critical theory space has been a central concern with karl marx and his writings so from the post-structuralist geo philosophy post-structuralist Geophilosophy. Uh, Gilles Deluge and Felix Guattari, and they are the post structuralists, and their geophilosophy is informed by post structuralist readings of space and place. You can think about these. These are the areas you can explore if you are picking up on the idea that this CI forum will drive you into research. From colonial and post-colonial studies, another source of this new um, spatial analysis, which brought into focus the effects of European domination over space and the migrations and interactions of different cultures and populations. Migration also is allied with space studies. From feminism and gender studies, where the issues of the body, sexuality, and the embodiment of the subject have long been central, of central importance. Another source is uh, popular culture and genre studies, where the specific practices of non-canonical cultural forms have been brought into sharper focus, and practitioners and theorists working in a number of other disciplines, architecture is one, ecology is another, and uh, migration studies is a third one. Now I'm giving you certain terms to mull over. And uh, if you can spend some time understanding what these are, you will have a very good idea of what to do in course of your work in hand. One is geocreativity, <laughs> geohumanities, geopoetics, geotexts, geoimagery, geohistory. I think I should stop there. <laughs> Geocriticism. Geocriticism reveals the socio-cultural dynamics of the relationship between space in literature and literature in space, which explores, and this is one of the practitioners of geocriticism, um, he says, explores six surveys 
digs into, reads and writes a place. Shamshad talked about writing a city that comes under geocriticism. It writes space, it tastes spaces. Now, I don't know whether you have seen an exhibition which still probably is going on in Bengal Gallery is called the Atlas of Descent by an artist called Dali Al Mamun. Please do that. Because this is a very post-colonial uh, understanding of how many things contributed to colonization and many things were taken from the East in course of colonizations. And he has actual spices brought. Spices, you understand, were one of the sources for which um, colonization had extended beyond the usual territories. Uh, in Indonesia, for example, Dutch colonization was for spices. India is another one. And, um, um, okay. And so space can be even, you can even taste space. Think about it. You can listen to space, you can touch space, you can smell space. So all these ideas are central in geocriticism. Um, and then you have space and place have become central concepts in the effort to interrogate the relationship between literature, ideological representations, and real and imagined spaces. For the developments in current geocritical studies, human geography and its practices have become relevant. Human geography and its practices have become relevant. Marc Auger, this is a French philosopher, um, defined the concept of something called non-place. So that is another teaser I'll give you. What is a non-place? Think of um, all the places where you don't spend much time, a bus station, an airport terminal, uh, a clubhouse, for example, or refugee camps and shanty towns. These are non-permanent. I want that a permanent address like that. So if you say my permanent address is Putupalong refugee camp, uh, the police will not accept it. Or they have been living there for a long time. You have to do something like this. And one of my students was asked, what's a permanent space? So simply like it's a magna. Because if the river, uh, whole village had been taken away and gone into the magna. He says, and then he says, you cannot be uh, magna. He says, okay, sir, I'll correct you, this Bay of Bengal. Because the village has been washed out <laughs> into the Bay of Bengal. So this permanent address is something he says, so non-place is something meaning spaces which are not themselves anthropological places and which, unlike in Baudelairean modernity, do not integrate the earlier places. Instead, these are listed, classified, promoted to the status of places of memory. So non-places is a very interesting phenomenon. You can work on that if you want. And then that's it. So I'm giving you a number of topics you can work on. And you can write down the topic, see if anything interests you. And I'm sure after, if my lecture has been, you know, 10% successful today. I'm sure you'll have at least half of you responding positively. Um, for example, relationship between literary geography and cartography. You can talk about cartography. Why was cartography such an important art and science at the same time, starting with the Renaissance and beyond? Then you can talk about postmodern play of spaces in the era of globalization. Remember, we are going through an era which began in the last part of 20th century, globalization. Globalization has been variously described as extension of the market throughout the world in the, uh, un under the condition of the Western understanding of the market, not ours. The global, global, globalization can be a new form of colonization. So globalization, created spaces. Um, so postmodernism tells you that these spaces have been created for a particular reasons. And then you have to explore. Exile, migration, and space. Just look at the Rohingyas today in our country or Ukrainian refugees in Europe, 5 million of them. And how they feel in migration, the need for a space, it is not theirs. National, super, supranational, 
or supranational, national, supranational, and border states. Border, there is something called no man's land, right? What does it mean to belong to a place in which is no man's land? What kind of a place is this? Immediately realize this is this has no association with man. Still, it is a very contested space. A no man's land usually means you are welcome there, but you cannot claim this as your own country's territory. It's no country's territory. But then the moment you step there, you might be gone down. So it is a no man's land, but it's every man's land or something, something. It's very contested. And there has been a story written by a young writer, Muzaffar Hussain, uh, no woman's land. And then Foucauldian carceral space and panopticon in our time, you can write on that. Space and power, you can explore the relationship between space and power. You can talk about how space is embodied for the individual in the immediate environment, including the implications it has for a specialized conception of subjectivity. You can talk about um, Space is emancipation, how space can be emancipation. You can talk about the political nature, strategic nature of space. You can talk about space versus place, two different things, but at one stage interchangeably. And you can talk about non-place. So that's my a bit unorganized uh, lecture because <laughs> I got into doing it last night. <laughs> and so I didn't completely finish this till this morning. I hope that I have given you some ideas you can think about and probably explore on your own. So that's it. Thank you. Could we please have a huge round of applause? We can't thank you enough, sir. We will never think of space the same way again. Thank you very much. You please stay for the question and answer round. So, so we will have a very brief question and answer round. Here's what's going to happen. If you have a question, raise your hand and one of our volunteers will come to you with a microphone. Question, please. As the Americans say, shoot. Shoot. Don't be shy. Now is your chance. It's not that the chance is going away. I mean, I am here. So anytime you feel like uh, shaping up a thesis based on what I have given you. You can always drop by. I'm here on Mondays and Wednesdays. The best time is to catch me there in my office is at 11. Uh, the bus is usually due, due by this time. And so you can come for 15 minutes talk. I can always answer any question you don't have. You have a question out of all people. Wow. How about uh, rented houses, rented places, rented houses, rented flats? Are they also kind of uh, in a kind of in a broad sense? Is there either because anything which is now considered a place of memory is something uh, it's there. Foucault has another notion called heterotopia, in which, like cemetery, like clinics, he says a lot of people are born in clinics and die in hospitals. So these are also places, but you don't claim them. And sometimes these no, uh, heterotopias are where meanings are contested. Fixity versus um, um, freedom. Um, places where you don't belong, but you have a sense of belonging for, it, for some time. Uh, heterotopias are also places where the subordinates can claim some power over their lives. So heterotopia is another term Foucault mentions. It has many, many ramifications. You can explore that too. In a sense, yes, but what happened to your rented mean, place? Thank you, sir. That means most of the city is nothing but a collection of non-place. In a sense, yes, because you don't belong to a city. You don't belong. Mm -hmm. um, nobody writes permanent address in a city, even if you have a permanent flat or whatever. Oi, <laughs> Yeah, okay. So we are stepping into the metropolitan culture. Yeah. 
There was an uh, ad Ekhon Grammar Bari Moti Jil. Yeah, okay. Our Grammar Bari Moti Jil, something like that. Live in urban spaces now. Oh, yeah, villages have become the, urban spaces. If you look at the demographics here. Yeah. I mean, cities, towns, and uh, urban locales. Once, Kaiser, I went with Nawazir Bhai, the great photographer, and uh, Ali Zakir to so a place in Kishorganj for she was fond of taking uh, wildflowers pictures. And we were very tired and everything. We trooped into the bazaar, and there was this cooling corner K O O L I N G, K O R N E R. Out of total curiosity, we stepped into it and we saw two girls from Kuliart or Cheese Factory spending some time there taking a sip from Coca Cola. That was early 1990s. So, if that was a sign of things to come, and I think if you go to any village, you are greeted by things that are done in Dhaka, produced in Dhaka. So I believe in 30 years' time, villages will dis disappear. And you will have a huge conglomeration of metropolitan uh, of structures throughout the country. I don't know what will happen. So space gives you a lot to think about. Um, if you are losing your own space, how do you protect it? Can you protect it or should you protect it? These questions are also important. Should you go with the flow and be the internal refugees? And I heard this term long time back, the refugees of the of mind. A lot of, lot of us probably are refugees of mind. So refugees are not simply who cross the border and come to your place. Internal refugees also are significant in number in our Oh, I... <laughs> No, no, I was just thinking as you were sitting in this very space, how the function of this space is not this. This space is supposed to be a cafeteria, we're supposed yeah. to be eating here, but in the absence of an appropriate space, an auditorium, we have reproduced or reshaped this space into this other, you know, giving it, giving it another function. And in doing that, we have actually displaced the people who have, were supposed to be here. So I was just looking at the people behind, you know, taking their food and eating over there when yeah. they were supposed to be here. So this was something like, you know, um... And also this mezzanine construction. Mezzanine floors are supposed to have an imposition of space. So from there, the ceiling is very low, but from here is very high. So this distribution of space is important because it catches your attention. You feel very happy when you are walking here. And after adjusting to this height, you go there, you don't feel so much claustrophobic. So mezzanine construction is also very interesting in architecture. It's an arrangement of space in keeping with your own understanding of height and depth. Yes. I think they had enough today. So if there is no other question, please, thank you very much. I really appreciate your sitting through my lecture. I saw only a few leaving. I, I expected more. I expected by the time in Exodus, everyone leaving. <laughs> so it only shows that you are interested in space. Maybe you have found this is a good place. So that's another thing, the space versus space. I think someday somebody gives you a lecture on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, a huge thank you to Monsoro sir for that extremely engaging speech. Now I would request um, the head of our department, um, Arifa Khaniraman ma'am, to please step to the podium and conclude the um, event formally. Thank you. 
Thank you so much to everyone uh, who stayed and who has been here throughout the whole program. And of course, my heartfelt thanks to Manzir Sir for um, you know, uh, hearing my request and uh, choosing to be here to give us this wonderful lecture, give us lots of things to think about, um, lots of things I think that we can talk about in the courses. I think each and every course that you're doing has something to do with this. So there's plenty of things to think about and talk about. So thank you so much, Mundu sir, for doing this. Um, my thanks, of course, to Shanta sir for making it here and uh, Kaisa sir for being here. Thank you very much to Sheikh Nahiyan and Mehit Chaudhuri for organizing this whole thing, for starting from the writing the CFP to this uh, arranging this forum. And of course, there is the second forum on Saturday at 11.30 at the ULAB Research Building. Uh, so please be there. So today's talk was related to spaces and literature. On Saturday, we'll be talking about spaces and language or linguistics so that you have an over, uh, you know, overall sort of an idea about how to connect all your courses to the theme. So, um, and of course, my thanks to all our volunteers, our TAs, the IT office for helping us, our admin officers, Leah and Kitty for um, helping with all the organization and um, our report writer, if I sitting there taking few no, notes furiously. <laughs> So thank you, everyone, and I hope to see you on Saturday. Remember, this is a mandatory uh, forum for all our students, so please, you need to be there. All right? You'll have research building on Saturday. Professor Shaila Sultana from the University of Dhaka will be speaking. Thank you. And we are offering some refreshments right over there. So please grab your refreshments.